Hello and welcome to the Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ram Kumar. So, in the past few weeks, we've been conducting a series of discussions with eminent people in the field of open science and open access. And for this episode, we have a similarly special guest with us who is an expert in evaluating research and identifying how the careers of various early career researchers have progressed during the past few years. The guest for today's episode is Dr. Paula Stefan from the Georgia State University. Uh, Nico, what can you tell us about her? So, yeah, we discovered her uh, at one of the conferences hosted by HHMI together with uh, SFDORA, uh, where they were talking about research assessment. And I think her uh, research actually fits quite well because she was looking at the careers of PhD students and postdocs in the States and analyzed it and saw how which career tracks they took. And I think this can be very interesting to uh, the people in or that are doing their PhD right now or postdoc, I guess. Um, so we hope that we will pro- give you some uh, helpful information in this podcast episode. So without any further ado, let's get on with the discussion with Dr. Paula Stefan. Dr. Stefan, welcome to the episode of Offspring Podcasts. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. And um, maybe as a starting point, could you maybe shortly tell us how you got to the position <laughs> you are in at the moment? Oh, well, um, I, I got a PhD in economics and I went on the job market many, many, many years ago. And I um, interviewed at probably five or six different places and ended up um, accepting a position here at Georgia State. And so um, I'd been here about six months, and I met a sociologist named Bill Amos, who was on the faculty, and eventually we got married. He was 20 years older than I, and he was very uninterested in moving, um, and it probably would have been harder for him to move, but he loved to travel, and he loved adventure, and he retired 32 years ago. Um, He unfortunately died three years ago, but he was always extremely supportive of my career, and Um, we decided to stay in Atlanta. So that's how I ended up being here. And um, I can tell you in a little bit how I got interested in kind of the economics of science and in not just exclusively, but in scientific careers. So anyhow, so I was hired by Georgia State. I was very interested in working in a city. I had offers for what we call liberal arts colleges and small towns. But I thought I'd have a much better life if I lived in a city, and I think that was an excellent choice for me. And um, I am officially retired, and now I'm a professor emerita, um, but I'm still very active, and I'm very active in the National Bureau of Economic Research. Indeed, one of the reasons I couldn't do these interviews last week is I was on Zoom meetings all week long for the NBER and with Reinhilde Vulliger, who's an economist at KU Leuven in Belgium, um, we organize a, a meeting every year on the science of science funding. So we had our meeting last week. So that gives you some idea of what I do. Now, one thing that I noticed in your CV was that um, actually you did a lot of uh, visiting or you had a lot of uh, visiting scholar positions Uh, was that uh, I mean I assume that was intentional so was it easy to get these positions well actually in not in no instance did I actively seek the position but in every instance I joyfully accepted them when they came my way 
So really the first visiting position that had a major impact on my life and my career was in Berlin, where I was invited to, and, and this visiting position started because um, I think this is a network story. So I think most visiting positions come about through networking. So I had a professor as an undergraduate at Grinnell College in Iowa who turned out to be on the advisory board for the Wissenschaft Zentrum de Social Forschung in Berlin, the Wetzel Bay. And in 1989, the Wetzel Bay had an open position to lead one of their research units. And this, my former professor named Robert Haveman, who at the time was editor of the American Economic Review, which is the top journal in economics in the United States. He recommended that they consider me for a position. So my husband and I went to Berlin and we spent a week in Berlin. Um, I was not selected for the position. I think there was already definite consensus about who was going to be chosen, but I enjoyed meeting people there and Two years later, I was notified that I wasn't selected, but I was invited to come as a visitor um, with my expense work paid and to come for four months. And that was great. I had just finished writing my book um, with Sharon Levin about scientific careers, and it's called Striking the Mother Load, and I put a great deal of time into that. And then as soon as that was finished, I chaired the search committee for a president of Georgia State University. And I was really ready to do something quite different. Um, my husband um, had been stationed in Frankfurt right after World War II. He spoke some German and he, was, and he loved opera. So he was unbelievably enthusiastic about the opportunity to come to Berlin. And so... We came to Berlin, the first time we came was for four months, and I was at the Wissenschaft Zentrum, and had an office there, went every day, and met people there. I still have good friends who are now retired from there, but I'm in touch with. And, and again, a network story. When I was in graduate school, school there was a professor named Shearer, Mike Shearer, and Mike Shearer in the 1980s had been um, a researcher at the Wetzel Bay. And Mike Shearer suggested people that I might like to contact at the Wissenschaft Centrum. And one of them was David Aldrich. And at the time I was studying biotech companies and the role that scientists and their reputation played in getting funding for um, biotech companies. And I had this data, and David and I started talking, and they were, and we worked together. And then um, I, it was time for me to come back to the U.S., and I got funding from a small grant, and I kept going back to Berlin. So I would visit for three to six weeks at a time over a period of about three more years. And so that's how one visiting position started. And it really um, contributed a great deal to my productivity, I think to David's also. And also at that time, I was writing an essay on the economics of science that was published in the Journal of Economic Literature. And it was a great time to work and reflect on that. And I love walking through the tear garden and thinking about it and talking to people about it. So and it was a wonderful time to be in Berlin. So... Then I became very involved in university administration for about eight years. I was the associate dean, which was really the person who made internal decisions about a policy school at Georgia State. And I kept coming to Europe for lots of conferences, but I didn't have um, many visiting positions. And then the next visiting position that really um, helped me a great deal was at, the, at, at Harvard. Um, through the National Bureau of Economic Research, um, and before that, because of my work on science, I had begun to work quite, quite closely with Richard Freeman, who's a terrific economist at Harvard. 
And Richard and I had shared lots of thoughts about postdoc issues and science funding. And I, at that point, I was finishing an essay, well, chapter for a book that Bronwyn Hall was editing and um, on the economics of science, but really updating it. And Richard invited me to come to the NBER as a visitor for, I, don't, I can't remember whether it was six or eight weeks, but it was wonderful. I had all these clippings. I mean, it's before um, I could download everything. So I, I came with lots of clippings from the journal Science. I had an office. I went to seminars. It was just great. And I thought a lot about it. And while I was there, I actually met with an editor from Harvard University Press and eventually signed a deal for the, the book. Oh, but I should go back. Before that, I had been a visitor. As soon as I stepped down as associate dean, I was a visitor for four months with Reinhilde Villiger at KU Leuven. I can't forget that at all. And that's because I met Reinhilde and I met, um, what, well, you probably have now figured out that I like Europe a great deal. So in 2001, my husband and I, with one other person, bought a small apartment in Paris. And I usually spend a great deal of time in Europe. And um, because I spend a lot of time in France, I had met Jacques Maurras. And Jacques Maurras is a terrific researcher who had initially focused most of his work on productivity. He was a colleague of Zvi Gorilikas years ago. And Jacques asked me to be on the dissertation defense committee of one of his students who was studying the productivity of physicists. And so I was, and one of the other people on the committee was Reinhilde, and we instantly formed a close friendship. So we started seeing each other a great deal. I've just spent an hour and a half with her on the phone, on Skype this morning, and she invited me to KU Leuven, and that was extremely helpful. And once again, I finished it by editing a book with Ron Ehrenberg, on, on science and the university. So, so while I was there at another conference in Europe, a young researcher from Italy approached me and her name's Chiara Franzoni and she had just won a postdoctoral fellowship from the Italian government and she asked if she could come and be a guest at Georgia State and we could work and talk about research. So. Um, she came, and we spent we went out to lunch every week for a year and talked about science. But we also became very, very good friends, and our husbands became close friends. And um, Kira went back to Italy. She ended up being a postdoc at Politecnico di Torino, and then she had some money. Um, and they invited me to come in 2008 for a visiting position, and we began to work on a paper with another person named Bebe Shalato on looking at being paid to publish in top journals, and we got a lot of data from the journal Science. So anyhow, um, that while I was there, um, it was a great place to work, and um, there was a fellowship I could apply for, and so I applied for this fellowship from an institute in Italy, and I went back to Torino. Mm, I probably spent I probably spent sixty weeks in turn in the last um, in the last eight years. I one of the fellowships allowed me to finish my book on um, how economics shapes science, so it was just wonderful. Once again, my husband was extremely happy because. He could go to the opera, we could go to the opera, and um, he, he really, really enjoyed Italy. So it was great. So it's all through networking, I think, and I continue, and I've been a visitor at the Max Planck Institute through Dietmar Harov, um, and I've worked, and Bronwyn Hall was there while I was there. So I've just been very fortunate, but I do think in terms of advice for young people, these have never been positions I applied for. It's all initially been through networking and being very, very open to opportunities. 
Okay, so this basically means, on the one hand, you really should try to build up your network and take every opportunity you get to speak to other people, uh, even if you don't know them uh, in the beginning, because it can form up to lifelong friendships, I guess, even. Oh, I think that's um, absolutely true. I mean, and I, a lot of these networks have turned out because somebody sends me their paper to read or I start thinking about something. And I will say... While I participated in an incredible number of Zoom conferences recently, I mean, the thing that's missing from Zoom conferences is this ability to really network and to go out and have a drink and have a great time talking with people, okay? And I think that's really going to be, um, I really worry about that for early careers right now, I think. And I also have to say, on the part of Kiera, it kind of took a lot of courage on her part to come up to me and say, you know, my name's Kira Frazzoni and I'd like to come and will you take me? I'd never met her. I had no idea what I was getting in for initially. And I thought about it for a little bit. And it was one of the best things that's happened to me in my life. Um, she and I continue to work together. She's up for an ERC grant right now. I'm on, she's now at, at Politecnico di Milano. I'm on the advisory board for Polytech. I go to Milan and work with her on a very regular basis. So anyway. Okay, so basically that also means that uh, younger researchers uh, should also approach uh, right. the senior faculty. And even if the chances might seem low in the beginning. I think that's okay. absolutely true. And of course... On Kiara's part, it helped a whole lot that she had the money to pay for it. Do you know, she wasn't asking me. I get an incredible number of emails all the time from people who want me to pay for them to come. And most people in the United States simply don't have that funding, although people do for postdoc positions. So. Mm -hmm. But it helped a lot that she had her own funding. Okay. Yeah. So you sort of covered the second sort of topic that we wanted to discuss about how you got involved researching uh, scientific, or like how your interest changed into researching scientific personnel. Oh, but that's an interesting story also. Do you want me to tell you a little bit more about uh, it? Of, of, of course. course. So once again, it's because of a network in a way. I accepted being a reviewer in the late, probably around 1979, the National Science Foundation, which is a big funder of science, I was asked to come and be a panel member to evaluate some proposals in kind of the social studies of science. And I don't really know for sure how they got my name because I hadn't done much work in the area at the time. But while I was there, a program officer said to me, um, Paula, you're an economist. And economists know more statistics than sociologists. And there's a very important, which was probably quite true at the time. I'm not sure that's so, well, it's still true, but sociologists have learned a lot more statistics in the interim. But he said one of the big policy issues for the United States is that the scientific research workforce has aged considerably. It's not nearly as young as it was 10 or 15 years ago. And that was really because federal funding, as a result of the war in Vietnam, had really decreased tremendously. So he said, you know, many scientists believe that science is a young person's game. You, you know that physics used to be called Naba physics, so the boy physics, you know? Um, and if it's true, if science is really a young person's game, we really have a problem in terms of doing breakthrough research. But we know that people who study that use cross-section data. It's not very well done at all. And we would encourage you to think about doing that. So I'd been working with Sharon Levin, and I told her about it. And we started looking at data, and we assumed that since NSF had asked me about the problem, they might be willing to fund it. And they also had 
the very best data about the workforce, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And no one had ever been given permission to work with this data outside NSF. So we started trying to see if we could get access to the data, and we wrote a proposal. And despite their encouraging words, they turned it down, and then they told us to write another proposal, and we did. And once again, they turned it down. And then in 1983, we submitted a third proposal, and they funded it. And they also helped get a private foundation, the Sloan Foundation, to give us money to help because NSF didn't have enough money and matching the data that we got access to with the Web of Science was quite expensive. So that's what we ended up doing. So, um, and so I got that and I became, Sharon and I collectively became what I think would be said experts in this data because we were the first people to ever have access to this data outside of the government. And because I began to know that data, I started being invited to serve, encouraged to serve on a number of national advisory committees run by the National Academy of Science. And the very first one was Trends in the Early Careers of Life Scientists. And that really taught me a tremendous amount about about, um, the, um, about the science side of it. I knew a lot about the workforce, but I was the only economist there and um, working with these people. And since then, I've served on 14 National Academy committees, including the Committee on Postdocs. So it's really because of this knowledge of data and then eventually of all of my research. Okay, so you were already talking more about this uh, this data that uh, you were uh, taking a look at. So could you maybe explain to us a bit what this uh, data is about and uh, what it showed uh, for the so, workforce? So this data is called, it, there are two databases in the United States. One's called the Survey of Earned Doctorates. And the Survey of Earned Doctorates, whenever you, every person who gets a PhD in the United States their university asks them to fill out the survey. And it tells a number of things about the person, where they went as an undergraduate, their age, how they were supported, whether they have a job, if they don't have a job, what their plans are, if they have a job, what the salary will be, et cetera. Now, most people think you have to fill this form out to graduate, to get your PhD. So over 96% of all the people who get a PhD in the United States fill this out. And this survey has been happening since 1958. It changed format significantly in 1973, and the data Sharon and I worked with was beginning in 1973. So this is annual data, and it's released fairly quickly. Like, it's released within about a year of being collected. Um, you can't get the micro, micro level data of it, but you can get a lot of trends from the web. And from this database, a sample is taken and the sample is followed longitudinally. And that sample is called the survey of doctorate recipients. And so we can trace out people's careers over time from that data. And that's the data that Sharon and I used for our, for our work. And that's the data that a lot of the analysis is done. But when you ask me about immediate outcomes for PhDs, I would always look at the survey of our doctorates. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, your, did this data show uh, some kind of trends that were um, in, uh, concerning the people that earned doctorates in the States? Oh, well, these trends changed quite a bit, okay? So we need to couch them. I mean, one of the things about PhDs is there's some wonderful times to get a PhD and some not so good times to get a PhD, all right? Um, if you got a PhD in the 1960s in the U.S., it was an incredible time to get a PhD. There were a huge number of jobs. There were lots of new universities. Um, the labor market was, we would say, very hot. And 
Likewise, in the late 1990s, with the big IT boom, it was a, a very, very strong market. I should say that the market in the biomedical field has not been very strong for a very long time, and that's because all of the incentives of the system encourage us to overproduce PhDs. We produce many more PhDs than research positions are available. So it really depends on the field, and it depends on the time. Okay, so you would say this uh, in the biomedical field, this continues to today, that there's just too many PhDs and far more than necessary uh, in the working force. Well, when I say there are too many PhDs, what I mean is that there are more people trained who want to do research than there is demand for research positions. Nobody, the unemployment rate for PhDs in the U.S., is exceedingly low. It's just that there are a number of people, and we keep seeing this in the data, who have been trained to do research and end up in positions that are not research positions. And it's really because universities do not hire that many, and industry is not hiring that many. Okay, so would you say then that the number of trained PhDs is too high or that they should rather be trained in a different way to not just think about having a career in academia or research? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, I've strongly come down on the side that we should not train as many people as we are training. Um, I feel that universities have decided that they should train them to do other things just because, of course, <laughs> it's bad public relations to train people and not have jobs for them. And I feel that they've moved into this argument that a PhD is a wonderful preparation for anything. Now, I think I understand that, but I think it's probably PhD training is very expensive. People are giving up lost wages somewhere else, so their opportunity costs. People are, we're spending a great deal of money as a federal government because in the sciences, most people are supported on somebody's grant or something. Um, so I think we're producing so many PhDs because we want them um, to be productive in the lab of their supervisor, not because we need them in the future. While 60 years ago, the big call was we needed these people, and we needed, even when Sharon and I did our work, we needed these people to, to do research. But um, that's not as true now. And even in 1998, when we wrote our report, Trends in the Early Careers of Biomedical Sciences, we argued in the report that too many PhDs were being produced then. And that was a very small number compared to now. And I should say the person who chaired that report was Shirley Tillman, who's a geneticist. And the next year she became president of Princeton University. And um, she stepped down from that position about five years ago. She remains a very, very strong advocate that we're overtraining and that We have too many disappointed postdocs. We can talk about postdocs also in that respect. Just maybe one more question before that. Um, so um, because the system in the U.S. and in Germany is a bit different, mm -hmm. I feel, especially since I mean, in Germany the master's degree is far more common. And in the States you go from uh, your bachelor's directly into a PhD right. program. So do you think this also contributes to the larger amount of PhD students in the States? Well, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a good question. In, in the U.S., a master's degree is called a consolation prize. I mean, if you decided you don't want a PhD, they'll figure out a way to give you a master's degree and say goodbye, okay? Um, so, but there have been a number 
of people, including myself, that think we should be giving specialized masters in these programs that combine business with with science or journalism with science or whatever, and that we really focus on those kinds of specialized training and masters. And master's programs have become increasingly popular in the U.S. One reason is they are a good way for universities to make cash from international students because most master's students don't get any financial support. They pay for it. But, um, I mean, that's something interesting to think about. But typically in the biomedical sciences in the U.S., the average time it takes to get a Ph.D., is between six to seven years. Okay, it's a long degree, and um, and the degree really only has much coursework for the first year. And so basically, you come into a program, and many of these programs have money from the National Institutes of Health, which are called training grants. So your financial support is paid through a training grant, and you rotate through labs to see what might be a good fit. Although there are also a lot of programs that don't have such a grant. Anyhow, with, by the time you're a second year student, you have definitely have been put in a lab, which either you chose or there's been some matching, and you're in that lab for the rest of your career unless something terrible happens. And um, you will be working um, as a research assistant in that lab, and part of that work will eventually turn into your dissertation. Let's talk about postdocs now. So, I mean, I feel like... A favorite like if you topic. Want... <laughs> yeah, I see. So, I mean, as myself, I'm, I want to right now at least stay in academia. So doing a postdoc in the States is, uh, as I think, the normal path to continue um, because a lot of people from my institute also did this and then came back to Germany to get a PI position. Mm -hmm. So what is the, like you mentioned it already before, that postdocs don't have a good situation in the States. Uh, so uh, can you maybe elaborate on well, this? Well, I mean... Let me, I need to elaborate what I mean by a good situation, okay? I, I mean, first of all, I think that the data suggests, although there, the surveys here are a little sparse, but that people, for example, in your position who come from Europe and don't want to stay in the U.S., but use the postdoc for training and for networking and for having access to different kinds of equipment, whatever, um, but that's a successful career path. I mean, I can't tell you what the probability that you'll get a position in Germany is from it, but I don't think that that's bad advice, okay? And, and Kiara and Beppe and I did a survey, which I didn't talk about, called the Globe Chi Survey, and we, we got responses from over 19,000 scientists in 16 countries, and, I mean... You can see from that, we know about their, where they took a postdoc, et cetera. You can see a lot of mobility, like you're talking about, that you leave your country to take a postdoc in the U.S., but that you go back, okay, and have. Okay. So my focus on postdocs has primarily been people doing postdocs in the U.S. who wish to stay in the U.S., all right? my What I know the most about is people who are doing postdocs in the U.S. who wish to stay in the U.S., okay? As opposed to people who are doing postdocs in the U.S. and with the ambition of returning. And we have, we don't have, I have data on the survey that Beppe and Kiara and I did on that, but historically the U.S. has not collected good data on people like your Like, like you're proposing to be. We haven't, we have good data on people who get PhDs here, but we don't get good, we don't have good data on people who come for a postdoc and then leave. Okay. Um, Reinhilda had a PhD student who did a survey, a little bit of a survey, and looked at some data on this. And then we have the data I referred to. So I think what you're talking about is a reasonable path for you. 
I think the bigger issue in the U.S. is that we have a huge number of people doing postdocs in the U.S. who either are U.S. citizens and plan to work here, or they have come for a postdoc and they view the postdoc as an entry point to staying in the U.S. Because in our survey, a lot of people said they came for a postdoc because it was a path they thought to citizenship and a permanent job in the U.S. Okay? So we need to differentiate that. So does that answer your question? Yes, uh, to some extent. I mean, so concerning the people that uh, are uh, want to stay, is the are the conditions then bad for those? Well, is it I a think lot harder? the big issue is that the U.S., the number of positions, faculty positions, that are opening up in the U.S. has been very small. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons. And there are a very large number of postdocs who would like a faculty position. Um, the mm -hmm. best data is on people who got their PhD in the U.S. Um, and we know that of the people who have definite commitments when they get their PhD, that about 70% of them, their definite commitment is to go get a postdoc. And mm -hmm. then if we ask people who have a postdoc, and I'm talking primarily about the biomedical sciences now, if mm -hmm. we ask people who have a postdoc what their desired job is, their, desired, their most desired job is to be a faculty member. Um, and a faculty member at a research institution where they could mm -hmm. do research and just teach a little bit. And sometime you might want to talk to Henry Sauerman, who is an expert on this and who currently has a faculty position in Berlin. Okay? So mm -hmm. at the same time yeah. zone, you should get him to come talk to you all at some point. He, he also, he's a, he's a co-author and we've worked together on some of these issues. So... So we have this large number of people, at least, um, who want a postdoc, and yet we mm -hmm. know that the probability that if you get a PhD in the biomedical sciences in the U.S., the probability you're going to be a faculty member is about 10%. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's a big gap <laughs> here. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people stay in a postdoc position for up to six, five to six years. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is this a good investment from their point of view? Um, the lab is probably getting quite a bit of research work out of them, but is it a good investment? And a, mm -hmm. a, a woman named Donna Ginther and her co-author, Sheila May Khan, um, have done work looking at the long-run earnings consequences of taking a postdoc, and their work suggests that in the United States, it takes 14 years to catch up to the earnings of what people who didn't take a postdoc earn. So you're paying quite a penalty for a long period of time if you take a postdoc. I mean, 14 years, that is a long time. So it's not, it's not a good financial investment. And people do much. And one of the things is if you're going to go into industry, many people in industry say that they'd rather train you rather than get a postdoc. And industry has some postdocs. National labs have postdocs. So I think that's one piece of it. I think another piece of it is that there's a, a strong belief, and there's probably some truth to it, that if you want a faculty position, it's very important to publish and want it to have a big publication. And this big publication, from postdocs' perspective, needs to be in either nature, science, or cell. And there are many people who keep waiting for this big publication. I like to call it the get out of jail free card, that they think that they will be able to get the ideal position. Well, we know that the probability of publishing in those journals is very small. And so it, 
it's it's you have people who just continue and continue and it becomes hard for them to know when to leave and historically advisors haven't been very good at telling them it's time to leave because they're getting work out of them and they're getting cheap labor from them Okay, that was the first part of our discussion with Dr. Paula Stefan. Stay tuned with us as we come back to you next week with the remainder of our discussions as we talk more about research evaluation and how the system needs to be changed for the evaluation to be more open, fair and transparent. Please check the show notes below to find more about Dr. Stefan's work and links to her various talks and discussions. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Network, and the working group of the Max Planck PhD Network known as the Offspring Magazine. Feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de with any feedback, comments, or suggestions that you might have. And if you have any suggestions for who you would like us to interview in our upcoming episodes. The intro-outro tune was composed by Srinath Ramkumar. The pre-intro jingle was composed by Gustavo Corizzo, who you can find in the show notes below. Stay tuned with us as we come back to you every week with another episode of Offspring Magazine, the podcast. With that, I bid you adieu and stay safe and stay strong.